Hello and welcome to the third episode of Unique by Fetchip, built through inspiration. My name is Katje van Leeuwen, your host during this virtual and interactive experience broadcast live from this time, Tilburg. Today we'll be exploring next-gen uh, lifestyle ideas to make happier fat chips. We have some mind-blowing content to share with you. And, oh, <laughs> there you are. Um, yeah, we have some mind-blowing content to share with you. Some very interesting guests who will share knowledge from their perspective and give insight in how this high-tech future already is and how that might affect fat chip future designs. And, of course, the opportunity for you to engage in live conversation with them. So do not hesitate to send in all of your questions throughout today's episode. But first, let me introduce to you my co-host of today's episode, Farouk Nefsi, Chief Marketing Officer at Fetship. Thank you so much for joining me today. And I know you have been looking forward to this specific episode, for this is totally up your alley. But do tell me, what is the necessity to talk about this topic in so much detail? Thank you, Kaartje. Um, everything about fun is up my alley, of course. Um, yeah, let's start with trends. If you look at trends, they're mostly defined by brands and uh, tastemakers, uh, if you will. And then they are shaped by customers uh, or consumers um, in the ever-evoluting uh, evol uh, uh, generational shift. If you look at the greater context of the world, um, a lot is happening at this moment. Um, uh, generational shifts, uh, demographic shifts, um, the level of innovation in technology, um, sustainability, look at the environment. All of that in the mix really translates in the complexity of our designs today and the enormous systems that are being installed on board. Um, I think we have uh, 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 gathered a, uh, a range of topics today from different industries and we have w uh, wonderful speakers and I'm hoping to inspire our audience today with uh, our program. Well, I think we will and I cannot wait. So let's dive right into it with a little peek about the future of Richard van Hooydonk. My name is Richard van Hooydonk. I'm a trend watcher, a futurist. And today I will bring you a message from the future. The world is changing, self-driving cars, technology, AI, the future of healthcare. And if you talk about it, which I do, you should be physically part of it. So I decided to have a chip injected into my body. And it's a really small chip, and it's now injected into my head. And after a bit of pushing and pressing, I finally became part of the Internet of Things. And it was really painful, as you can see. And it looks like this. But these chips, they actually feel like tattoos. So if you have one, you want to have more. So I decided to have another one. It's the second chip. And the nicest things of this chip is that I'm able to open my door. I'm able to open my car. The world around me is connected to this chip. All repetitive and predictable tasks will be taken over by machines. This is the Amazon warehouse. In the early days, we had people working there. Now machines take over their jobs. This is an example of the agriculture of the future. Cameras are able to see and check the tomato. And when the tomato is ripe, the AI sends a signal to a robot, and the robot picks the tomato. So all those repetitive, predictable tasks are taken over by machines. Let's talk about healthcare. We all want to grow old and stay healthy. Apple iWatch is able to measure your body but in a year from now, they will implement diabetes. What do you think about that? Smart clothes, measuring you when you go out or go to the gym. And one of the amazing things right now is that scientists are able to measure your iris and do diagnostics and see how you are. And this is now implemented in smart mirrors. And those mirrors will tell you how you are today. Another group of scientists were able to listen to your voice. They're able to separate sick voices from healthy voices. And the nicest thing is that we walk, we talk, we look into mirrors while our bodies are measured in real time. And that's our future of healthcare. The next step is that we will go into our bodies. Small robots that will measure your body from inside. There's a Nobel Prize winner. You won a Nobel Prize for this concept. That means that in the near future, you will have a signal a couple of hours before a heart attack or a couple of months before a seizure. Really tiny nanorobots that are implemented 
and programmed to find cancer and destroy it. And one of the amazing things that's happening right now is sight. This guy became blind when he was four, and he now has a brain chip implemented below his eyeball that projects the stuff he sees directly into his virtual cortex. That's the place in your brains where you create the images. And this is what he sees right now. But in five years from now, he will see clearly, you know, better than a cat. He will be able to zoom in, zoom out, AR, VR, Netflix. A lot of people tell me, I don't think this is possible. But last year, the first person got the first bionic eye implemented in New York. So it will happen. One of the most invasive technologies right now is brain technology. This guy lost his arm because of a car accident and now has a brain chip implanted, steering his artificial arm. And my son, he suffers from epilepsy. I would beg him to have such a chip. And this is the reason why I think brain technology will be wonderful for a lot of people who suffer from brain diseases. This monkey, this is Elon Musk Neuralink monkey. This monkey is now able to play the game Pong thanks to technology. And he's able to show us that it's possible to cure brain diseases. But we need to talk about ethics because the world of tomorrow could be horrible. We need to make some ethical agreements. We have big challenges coming up. What do you think about people working in harbors? They won't work in 10 or 20 years from now because robots take their jobs. What do you think about Google? offering high educated jobs, only to men and not to women. What do you think about Amazon spying their people so when they don't work, they are automatically fired by an algorithm? And the best question is, do we want to live in this world? In the end, we need technology to make the world better, smarter, healthier. What do you think about brain technology? What do you think about healthcare technology? I mean, it's clear that it will help many people. We need more people building houses, but we don't have them. So we need technology to achieve these goals. It's the same with agriculture. In 2050, we need two times more food. We can do it with our current strategies. We need robotics, we need AI. What do you think about cars? Usually cars are really expensive. This car is 3D printed and it only costs you $3,000. So I think the world of tomorrow is wonderful. Luxury vessels will also have a lot of innovations coming up, like self-floating vessels, interactive glass, drone support, smart materials, predictive maintenance, solar and hydrogen-powered vessels. And I think in order to keep up with the fast pace of change, we need new people. We need the new Mark Zuckerberg. We need the new Elon Musk. We need powerful people that help us going to the next direction. Do you remember the pipeline in Texas that was hacked a couple of months ago? The company who did this, they made two billion a year. We need people that protect us from cyber criminals because cybercrime is a business model. So challenges and wonderful things are coming up. In order to build the world of tomorrow, we need passion. Passionate people, critical thinking, curious people to build the world of tomorrow. And this was my message from the future for you. Thank you so much. Wow, Farouk. I mean, I can't deny I am in a slight shock. And it's disruptive at the same time. Yes. So the question is, what does this have to do with anything about yachting? That's exactly what we wanted to showcase. Um, if you look at the uh, space that, that innovation is taking place and technology is evolving, everybody thinks it's a far-sighted uh, vision into the future, but it's actually happening today. And if you look at our own industry, it's, it's adapting in such a uh, uh, pace ever in history. So that is the reason why we want to showcase. Yeah, but how specifically does this has to do anything with our business? Yeah, that's, there are many reasons for that. But before we do that, let's dive into history and go to Tano, our head of design, our sidekick of today. He's going to tell us a, a lot more about that. Tano, thank you very much. Yes, indeed. Um, well, that's the question. Lifestyle, trends. Uh, I get this question a lot, of course. Uh, what are the trends for the coming years in your design? And I wish I could tell. Uh, I can't look into the future. But maybe it's a good idea to look into the past. So I'm going to take you back into the past a bit uh, to show you what is happening with the trends that we see um, in our industry and at FedShip. 
And the interesting part there is that, um, of course, as designers, we like to think that we are the guys that are the trendsetters. However, uh, what we are doing at Fetchip is creating uniqueness together. So we sit down with a blank sheet of paper with our clients and collaborate into that design and make it happen to their wishes. So maybe it gets you thinking whether they are not the, uh, the trendsetters in our life there. But let's park that for a while. Um, because the super yacht trends that we see, and indeed I have to say they're coming from our clients, are for instance uh, pushing the envelope, one thing, so pushing it further than it did before. Going further, the second one, it's exploring the world, which is awesome that we can do that. And the third is actually sustainability. And I'm going to dive a bit dive deeper into that. Because I had a chat uh, with uh, this man over here. It's our legendary former uh, president and, and uh, designer of Fetchip, Mr. Fritz de Vogt. And he's seen it all. And he told me a story about a yacht that they uh, designed in 1975. And uh, it was delivered in 1978, El Rajit. And El Rajit had a, a pool on the top deck. It was something that was not done before in that large, uh, in that large scale. And the pool had to sink down into that deck. Uh, so it was below the deck. The pool was there in the lounge. And what they came up with, he and the client, to put portholes in the side of the pool, so glass panels over there. And that makes it very interesting for the light coming into that lounge, but also look into the pool, of course, from the lounge. And I think nowadays we take it a few steps further, as you can see here on the picture of Faith. Full bottom glass, uh, glass to the sides. Uh, it's taking it, again, not one step further, but more steps. It is very interesting to see that in 1978 already the thought was there, the knowledge and technology wasn't there yet, but now we are there. So what is there to come? And going to the next one, and that is also a kind of a thing that <laughs> Mr. Fritz de Vogt uh, told me. He said once, okay, you know what yachting is? Yachting is camping on the water. And to me that makes totally sense. It is enjoying yourself on the water, with your friends, with your family, and again, we're pushing that envelope together with our clients. As you can see here, we've got these big hatches on the aft and on the sides to open up beach lounges to co come close to the water. And we've got these, uh, what we call a Nemo lounge, which we have done on Savannah. And you see that coming up more and more and pushing it to the max. And also toys, very important, of course, to enjoy yourself on a yacht. But back in the days, the yacht was smaller, and the yacht already was a toy. So nowadays, you've got a mothership, which is a big toy, and then the toys on that mothership, and even the shadow boats that are following it with more toys. Enjoying yourself on the water is very important in this case, and we are trying to explore more ways to get that even better. And entertainment on board, same thing. Um, what you see here is on the on the left is the Meduse, the recording studio, full recording studio for a band could play there. They could mix everything, and nowadays we've got uh, personalized IMAX theaters on board, which is amazing. I mean, if you put that together, all these companies that are interacting uh, to make this happen in the yard nowadays, it's what can happen in the in the days to come. And of course, gyms and uh, saunas and, and all the things that you can think about of entertaining sports, we are diving into that and making it even better, an experience on board that is going to be amazing. And later on uh, in our panel, we're going to talk about that also a bit more. Then the second trend that we see is going further. All our yachts are built to cross the oceans, go anywhere you want. But we all, we've also got clients that are very much uh, into the looks of the seagoing sea explorers. And we see that more and more nowadays. If you see here, most of the pictures, we see sh uh, Shanghai, which was delivered just last week. Great party. Um, and we have Promise that was delivered a few years ago and now traveling the world, going to places that you can't imagine. So beautiful. And of course, we've got Sherpa, one of the 
yeah, this is physically the most, uh, how do you say that, um, explorer yacht type yacht that you can imagine. And then you also see Archimedes. And I see that here. Archimedes is traveling the world to places you can't imagine again. And this brings me to the next topic, uh, the next uh, super yachts getting greener, which is one thing that was, I think, the topic of the Monaco Boat Show l this year. Everybody was talking about it, sustainability. How are we going to get more sustainable than we do now? We're working very hard on that already at FedShip. We are implementing a lot of things that are uh, known right now and trying to be one step ahead of everybody, of course. But everybody's trying to do that. So I think what we should do in the super yards, and we as FedShip think that we should do that, is come together and incorporate that into a common sense. Like one of the platforms that is there is Water Revolution Foundation or the Yeti platform, things like that, just to collaborate within the industry to make things happen, and e rather sooner than later. All these things that I just talked about, we have incorporated into our new concept of, uh, of this year that we have uh, proudly announced in, uh, in, in, uh, on the Monaco Boat Show. And later on in this, uh, in this episode, we're going to talk about it a bit more. Jan is going to explain everything about this, our designer, Jan Schaffers. He's going to explain how it works, what it is, and uh, what it looks like internally. So, I wish you lots of fun on that one. Thank you so much, Tano, for this quick overview. And beautiful to see how FedShip has been so innovative over the years. But today, We'll talk about the future and we'll do so with our guest, our first panel here, uh, Eva Ninkontia, brand strategist, storyteller, marketing and communication um, specialist, Francesca Musio, designer, architect and co-founder of M FM Architecture, Pedro Sabion Tavares, architect and project manager at Snowetta. Thank you so much for joining us today, Eva. To start with you, you are very much involving the impact of the next generation into your strategies. So how do you see those technologies impacting the demands of the next generation? Thank you very much. And uh, first of all, I want to say thank you for the invitation to be part of the panel today. So I think what the movie has shown is that we live in an exciting time of great changes. And um, the potentials are amazing and the opportunities are very wide. So the question really is for me, who are the drivers of the changes and what matters to them? Because technology is nothing without the human touch. So um, today, the millennials, which is the generation between 20 to 43 years old, more or less, and uh, Generation Z, 10 to 20, 23 year old, cannot be ignored. So 130% of the growth in the luxury market will be driven by those generations in the next seven years. By 2026, 60% of the luxury market will be uh, represented by millennials and 8% by Generation Z. So this is really uh, audiences that we cannot ignore. And uh, if those are the actors of the changes, I can say that COVID-19 has acted as an accelerator. Traditionally, Brands have evolved and society has evolved, but COVID-19 has really accelerated the pace of dramatic changes in our society. So as a brand strategist, I look at those uh, generations not only because of their weight in the purchasing power, let's say, but also because they are really the ones that will drive those changes in terms of using and adapting those technologies that Richard was describing to enable the vision of the world that is more in tune with the personal values. So if the episode today is about being built by inspiration, uh, as a brand strategist, I want to say that for brands, it's very important to look at those generations because they will enable you to stay relevant and build your sustainability and your longevity as a brand by either identifying new products, new services, new opportunities of new audiences, or uh, re making evolving your brand positioning and strategies. So to just start really diving into it, I want to focus today on two main topics. So the first trend I want to touch upon is the digital world. 
So both generations are very internet savvy and digital savvy. So Generation Z actually is the first digital born uh, generation. They have not known the world without internet. So both generations really have a, a more fluid relationship between the digital world, what it can bring into their physical world. And we can see this translated as the first expression into uh, a new sense of what um, your work-life balance is and your patterns of um, working are, because this is all facilitated by technology. And while it was a wish already present before COVID, obviously COVID has forced all of us to uh, adapt those uh, um, changes in a very much uh, urgent way. So today, the boundaries between your work office and your living spaces are very much fluid, and these are things that are being designed. So this is what we call the new normal that is being um, thought of and designed right now. And uh, the second uh, thing from that uh, trend is that uh, we are seeing the rise of the gaming industry. And the gaming industry is uh, really a new era for brands to investigate. 50% it, uh, it 50 of the millennials today are uh, in the US have some kind of subscription into gaming services. This is worldwide the number one entertainment for the millennials and their families. So this is an area that we cannot ignore, and it opens a lot of reflections either on the way you design and engineer user interfaces, or uh, on the way of that brands can approach uh, the way they uh, do PR or communicate with their audiences and target new audiences. So this is a very exciting new um, area. And uh, uh, tran transferring from that, we can say that there is a lot of uh, new tools between the artificial intelligence and the crypto uh, technologies that are being developed right now. And they are also representing something that we can uh, evolve the way we relate to our customers in a very personalized way. If luxury is the ultimate personalization to your taste, then those technologies offer new uh, ways uh, for the customer journey by uh, either facilitating authentication processes or by offering um, new ways of uh, embodying uh, an art and having like the DNA of the owner of the family. For example, um, there is a science called cymatics that uh, transforms the sound into the effects of matter. So you can realize artwork with uh, the voice of the owner and his family, and that artwork can be displayed. We can also imagine uh, things with the NFT art. So we know that Christie's, for example, this year had the first auction that was dedicated to NFT artwork. So this is a very exciting new area. And um, uh, so the next things for this is that um, it really can enhance your customer experience, as in, um, I think, Farouk, you are sharing with me that uh, the, the best part that your customers describe for you is the journey between when you start collaborating until the yacht is birthed. So I think that there's a, a journey with lots of memories, lots of emotion, lots of collaboration and exchanges. And we can uh, use the crypto te technologies to have a very safe and secure system to collect those memories. So this is a redesign of the customer journey. And when we talk about collective memories, we talk, of course, about emotions. And we humans, we are driven by emotions, and especially in the luxury market. So that allows me to go actually in the second trend that I want to tap into today with you guys, which is conscious consumerism. So these generations are generations that really see that uh, their life can be built around four pillars of the planet, the people, the personal values, and profit. So this all has to inhabit uh, their lifestyle, and they think that it's really possible. So um, the first trend that I want to highlight on this one is uh, the fact that they want to take care of the planet. So... This is the search for new materials and uh, that are more organic, that are more sustainable. And COVID-19, through all the um, uh, restrictions we had for transportation and for sourcing of uh, materials, have forced people to really think about the stories behind the material, your local impact, your local footprint. 
So this is also a very exciting new developments that are happening today, and hopefully the other panelists will talk more about that. Um, the next point of this uh, um, quest from this, these two generations is really the importance of taking care of the self. It's like being in an airplane. If the airplane crashes, you have to put your mask on yourself first, and then you take care of the others. So self-awareness uh, and self-care uh, is really an important topic, and they are um, uh, questing more for the yoga, the wellness, holistic spaces inside the yachts. So this is a trend that is only going to be increasing right now. And to finish, I want to uh, tap onto the fact that they also want to take care of people. So this is uh, millennials have 56% of millennials are more sensitive to brands that have a sustainability positioning. And so it's very important now, this sense of community was even more urgent, made urgent with COVID-19, because we saw that things we took for granted are no longer um, uh, safe. So the sense of human touch, the sense of longing of community is to, needs to be recreated and needs to be uh, valued. So this is um, a generation of activists, especially Generation Z. And so that trickles down into philanthropic in initiatives that are the give uh, back uh, mentality and mindset that needs to be developed by brands, like uh, the Water Revolution Foundation by Fedship, for example. It's even taking it a step further, because now these generations, they don't really want just a brand saying this is uh, something that we do that looks nice because we have to tick the box or something to put in our annual report. This is really something they want the brand to embody, the governments to embody, and they want to be part of it. So that is a bit of a, a shift in the, how we uh, approach these kind of initiatives nowadays. So I want to finish my part by saying that uh, the invitation from this generation is really to build a better world a more, with more positive impact and to build it together. And the future is being built now. Yes. Wow. So amazing. It's so inspiring. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. Um, yeah, I'm sure there, there are many questions. So uh, we will get there in a moment. But first, Pedro, I would love uh, to hear from you. What is your perspective on, on all of this from your architect point of view? Uh, thank you. I mean, from the architect's point of view, first of all, talking about future in any way, talking about future developments, we need to uh, look at what is happening now and how things are changing right now. And uh, for us as designers, we are also, we are sort of problem solvers. So we, we basically need to understand what are the problems or, or the challenges of the future in order for us to design around it. Um, and we see, we can see examples of this, of course, now with COVID. So with COVID, uh, we suddenly had the challenge of people having to work at home. It's not that working at home was a completely new thing, but everybody was forced into this reality uh, of working from home. So the infrastructure was there uh, to make it possible, but people suddenly had their houses uh, being transformed into also their workplace. Um, and now, uh, with the world transitioning gradually out of this reality of lockdown and only being at home, we see um, companies and offices having to uh, be reinvented in a way. Or uh, the reality of working at home has become a standard that everybody uh, sees as happening still. Uh, so, so the size of the office space is something that the companies are looking at decreasing and, and people are working some days from home and some days from the office. And in, in this more uh, fluid, let's call it, working environment, it's, it's of course um, new necessities come through. Uh, I was uh, talking to a colleague uh, earlier and I mean, one thing we see now being back in the office is of course that with all the video conferences, uh, we are not sitting by our desk, we are sitting in calls all the time, so suddenly we need more meeting rooms, and, uh, and we also go to the office because we want to talk to people. Uh, and I think that is something that we see also in other aspects of life, where we have the digital world coming in very strongly, but we still long for the, the human experience or the, the, the intimacy of being together or, or experiencing something. Uh, so if we look at shopping malls, for example, um, uh, Richard von Hoyden was talking about the Amazon uh, warehouses. 
I mean, we can buy stuff online and we can have it delivered to our door in a matter of days, but uh, we don't experience what we are buying before we see it, and, and it's something that we... Uh, it's, it's, it's utilitarian in a way, it's not an experience. So the, the shopping malls uh, and, and other retail spaces are of course becoming more a place where you, where you experience the brand and where you experience the products. You don't necessarily buy them, actually. You can go home and you can find the cheapest uh, store online. Uh, but uh, but it, it becomes a place where you can feel a certain intimacy with the people and the brand and the, and the products of the, of the space. Uh, and, for example, looking at the Apple stores, they have, of course, been very minimalistic, always just displaying these uh, devices to access, actually, the digital world. <laughs> And, and they are now, in the new generation of Apple stores, they are going from being purely about the products into being about uh, more the experiences and gathering together. So, so they are looking at their stores more as, um, as a sort of town hall or a, a town square where you can meet, where you can uh, learn about the products or learn about other things like a photo class or something like that. Um, so I think if, if we take that same reality back home into our homes. I mean, in the office space, we're of course uh, looking at how the office is changing, but the fact that we are working from home, we are also realizing that our homes need to change a bit. So we are not using the, the living room in the same way we used to. Suddenly, the dining table is also your work table where you're uh, working from. And, and, and during COVID, it was of course no time to redo everything, but it's something that we see in our projects that suddenly the home office or a space to work in or the reality of having a space that transitions in different times of the day from being your workplace to being your personal place to gather with family is something that uh, is important uh, in the development of projects. Um, in At home, but also around, we, we see uh, a longing for comfort. I mean, it, it's been talked about and there's going to be more probably about the well-being and, and uh, this awareness about the body. We also see it in, in the way we live. So, uh, I mean, historically, living rooms and, and office uh, lounges and so on, they have been quite formal. You're, you're sitting upright and you're, uh, they look nice and you look nice, but they're not necessarily very comfortable. Now, uh, what we see in these spaces is that they are becoming much softer, much more comfortable. So, so people want to, to be comfortable. And, and we also see it actually in, in the clothing. So the, even uh, the big fashion names have now clothing that is much more comfortable. So it's not about a Chanel suit. You can have actually a Chanel jumpsuit or a Chanel sweatpants, you know. So it's, it goes in, in, uh, in that direction as well. I mean, we, we were talking before about uh, Generation Z or the new ger generations that are coming up. I think one, th one thing that is also important to think about in the built environment is the fact that we are becoming younger at heart. So we are basically de-aging in a way. Uh, if we look at where our parents are uh, or where we are and look at pictures of our parents or their, our grandparents at the same age, we think they are much older. Uh, so so we, we live in a younger way. And if we take that into, for example, retirement homes, people are living longer, they are more healthy, and they are more mobile. So uh, it's not that you are designing a care home. It's you, you need to think about the fact that the old people are running around. They are doing aerobic classes, <laughs> maybe yoga, uh, all of these things. So, so it's really also there you need to think about uh, how, how things are changing and evolving. Um, yeah. Yeah, wow. No, it's, I think it's very relatable. And it's also, yeah, very, very inspiring. Um, thank you so much, Pedro. Uh, Francesca, so what are your thoughts on all of this from an interior design perspective? And also, I'm very curious, what are the latest developments that we see in this? Thank you so much for, for the question, because I think uh, today, uh, as creative people, uh, we have a great opportunity. I foreseen uh, the, the three great uh, topics. The first, of course, is the great rebirth. 
The second, uh, and I think Eva already uh, touched, uh, is the digital approach, so the convergence between physical and digital uh, approach. And the third, I can say the uh, power of nostalgia, which is something uh, very interesting as a trend. So uh, I think uh, the first uh, uh, that uh, I was mentioning is uh, the great rebirth, so to restore the human touch. So the the, the quarantine uh, brought us, us the awareness of uh, uh, how much is important the domestic comfort. So that's why we were uh, uh, probably uh, craving uh, for uh, human touch because of the social distance, because of many of these things. So I think today we want uh, to uh, we, we want to have a more tactile environment. Tactile is not only about material materials and fabric, but something more deep. Uh, we were, uh, I was mentioning Freedom that uh, with Ian just before that we design, and I think uh, they um, promote the well-being is something that uh, is coming out. So the new generation, they are taking care about their body and their mind. They are spending, they are willing to spend more money uh, and more effort to f on, the, on the personal care. And uh, we are realize how much is important the pandemic, the, during the pandemic, the environment. Uh, and uh, for example, this is, a, is something that we did uh, on board uh, of a yacht uh, with you and in, in a villa. So uh, produce vegetable inside uh, your home or your, your yacht is something really interesting. So uh, this, uh, uh, this is something that uh, uh, plays also, put also us in connection with the nature. And uh, to, to do this, uh, we have uh, to think to different, differently. To, to, we have to think uh, different layouts, uh, for example. So the idea to have uh, a more in-out uh, uh, perspective. So look the, the yacht and the homes from the interior to the exterior point of view. So this is something really interesting. I call alfresco appetites, uh, this one. So some area that are more fluid and you can uh, design furniture for either for inside or outside the same uh, typology. So I think uh, uh, this is uh, also this direction to the, to the nature. Uh, in the new generation uh, is also take care of the local uh, environment. So the luxury today goes local. Uh, so the people, uh, they, they want uh, to, to, to use, uh, to source material locally. Uh, the tradition, I see also new generation, we are involving artisans in our business, uh, we are involving, and also the idea uh, to make, uh, to, uh, to, to have a more simple life. I think uh, what uh, was the, 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 the idea was to make interiors that are more uh, timeless and simple. So in a way that your life is less complicated. This is something uh, I think that uh, we are experiencing. And I think in the future, the luxury um, come down to simplifying choice. Then another important trend I was saying is the digital approach. So I'm, I'm envisioning uh, hidden technology. So an environment which is tactile, very, uh, very materic and analogic because the new generation, they are uh, caring about analogic, uh, but with a very sophisticated hidden technology. For example, uh, entering your yacht and uh, uh, behind the screen have a body screen. And, you know, this is uh, the video that was really Shocking, I agree. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and then uh, I think uh, um, the other important is how to the, the new generation, they want uh, to experience the design before to buy. So we have uh, the gaming is something that uh, we have to, to use the gaming technology to present uh, our uh, renders or our projects. So uh, the other um, things that I was mentioning is the power of nostalgia. Nostalgia is uh, something that happens because probably the people are scared about the, the, the momentum. And so the typical, they go back to their memories, to, to their belonging. So here we have some interiors that, uh, uh, and they want to collect vintage pieces. 
So, and it's something that can happen also in the yacht industry. For example, see the, uh, the, the refit not only the refit of a yacht not only as a second-hand choice, but really for a buzzer or something that uh, uh, could be a collecting, like in uh, the Fed Ship Heritage, you are collecting a piece of art at the end, you know, or you are restoring something beautiful. So the other uh, things uh, is uh, the, um, the idea that uh, the sustainability is uh, a promise. So I think uh, more uh, something that is sustainable uh, has to, to be quality and long-term uh, resist. So that's why we, we, we place a, a, a yacht, a fed ship in this case, uh, that we just delivered in, uh, in the front of, uh, of uh, Duomo di Milano. And <laughs> this is uh, something I think provoking, uh, but uh, I, want, I want to say that uh, in this world that the fast food, the fast fashion, so we are uh, losing the, con the concept of the quality. Yeah. So quality and longevity is, I think, uh, something that uh, at the end is the more sustainable thing that you can build. Yeah. So yeah. this was the <laughs> idea. So thank you so much. Yeah, it's so interesting and and fascinating. So I'm sure we have a lot of questions from the audience. Uh, but uh, let me have a look. Fo oh, you look like you have a question. I always have. <laughs> you always have a question. <laughs> okay, you go first. Um, I will pick. I will. I will go into my iPad and and find. Oh yes, we have many nice questions. But go ahead, Farouk. Thank you all three with the very insightful uh, uh, content. A timeless is beautiful yeah. word also. Um, Eva, y you talked about uh, the gaming world. Um, I have seen in several games, product placements, uh, you can even dress your avatar with designer clothes. Yeah. How big is this world? Can we, uh, do we have any knowledge of that? Yes, it is uh, actually people underestimate, but today the gaming industry, its, uh, re its revenue is more than the combined revenue of the music and the movie industry. So this is a huge, huge industry and uh, brands are still learning how to tap into it and how to develop it. So it represents a lot of opportunity for product placement, as you are mentioning, but also product launches. Uh, finding new brand ambassadors. So if I take the top uh, nine uh, game players in the UK, uh, their collective revenue last year was 2.6 billion. So these are new audiences that uh, people in the luxury world need to tap into. And uh, this is still uh, a place and we can fine tune thanks to data, where you appear as a brand, how you communicate, who do you communicate, to which age and which revenue group. So this is a very precise area, and so it, this is great for brands, obviously. Well, thank you. thank you, Ava. Yeah, we have many questions from the audience, so I'm just going to try and get as many as I can through. Um, the first question will be for you, Pedro, and it comes from Stephen. And the question is, do you think yachts will become more like a home office place, and how will that reflect on the general arrangements of yachts? That's a very interesting question. I, I think absolutely that the way a yacht is organized is something that will yeah. change. Uh, I mean, already the reality of how a yacht is used is quite different from how it's designed, in a way. The, yeah. the main saloon was a space that was used for big crossings inspired by uh, steamboats crossing the Atlantic for weeks, and it's the only place you can socialize. Well, today, socializing is actually something that you don't necessarily even need to do with other guests on board. You do it online, you do it through Zoom. So, so being on the boat, you're connected with all these other people. Uh, so the spaces on board, they need to, of course, take that into consideration and, and, and be, uh, deal with the reality of, uh, of uh, ever-changing use as well. So yeah. uh, before, you can imagine that the boat was really used for transport and yeah. you were moving with the boat. Today, the owner can fly somewhere and he can get to his boat and he can get off it again. Uh, or he can work on board uh, and, um, and, and also um, relax. So basically, the answer is yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, yeah, no. Thank you so much, Pedro. I have, I have an, a, a question from Anna for Eva. Uh, technology can alienate us from human interaction. Um, won't there be a counter movement with a generation who uses less technology? I think there's always a, a, 
lost for going back a bit of nostalgia and uh, when you have uh, like an acceleration of a trend. But uh, probably like the generation, especially the Generation Z, was born with all these technologies. So they don't know the world without it. So I would say that more than uh, going back to a totally analog time, is like Francesca was saying, there will be maybe an analog surface, but it will be a lot of intelligent, smart technologies supporting the way you live and supporting that you can enable your values to be embodied in your everyday life. And, uh, and then the word ethics that Richard was tapping upon is going to be a very important one. So how much uh, do you, can you create and how much is it affecting our human relationships? I think one of the things from COVID was that we realize we can praise technology for what it enables us to do. And we can also realize how much the human longing of community and relationship is important. And those two are we're going to cohabit together. Yes, okay, well, I'm very curious how this is all going to evolve. I'm afraid, um, yeah, we have to move on to our next topic of today, uh, but I just want to thank you so much. And uh, for all of you at home who are watching, we will make sure all of your questions will get answered um, by our experts. Um, so thank you again so much. And I just realized I actually have a question for Tano. Uh, Tano, um, in the past, all the tenders and toys were designated to a certain area. Could you tell us something about that and how that evolved over time? Yes, of course, Kaatje. I can, because I, I dove into the history of Fetchup again, back into those uh, files. And what I found were pictures of all the tenders on the out decks. So outdoors, there are tenders on the fore deck or the top deck or wherever you could find it before the 90s. And in the 90s, you notice that all, almost all the boats after that have them now under decks. So that's somewhere else. And that means that all the decks can be used for playing ball <laughs> or playing football, even soccer. And indeed, Kaatje, tennis, your favorite. <laughs> yes, yeah, no, I would love to do that. I mean, can you imagine? Or like a round of golf, that would be also fantastic. So thank you, Tana, for giving us these, uh, these smart insights. And by the way, talking, talking of uh, golf, Farouk, did you know that when you play golf on a deck, these balls, as soon as they hit the water, they become biodegradable and it actually turns into fish food? What do you think? <laughs> of course we know. <laughs> you knew that. Wow, I think that is absolutely wonderful. And what is also wonderful is that I see we have some new guests in our midst. Absolutely beautiful. Um, yeah, we have Bram Jongepier, Senior Design Specialist at, um, at Studio De Voogd, and Jan Schaffers, Designer at Studio De Voogd, have joined us in our studio. And digitally, we also have Ian Langham of Eckersley O'Kehan present with us today. Gentlemen, welcome. And Ian, you can hear us. Yes, yes, I can yes, hear you. Yes, wonderful. Thank you, thank you. Because, yeah, we will dive into our next topics. Uh, applications, glass, hatches, uh, swimming pools. We're going to move into the next video, actually, first. Yes. It's all about, all about that. Glass. Yeah, let's move into, uh, first into the video to have a little bit more contest. <laughs> Hey Dominique, how are you? Yeah, fine. Just had a very nice holiday. And actually just checking if we can install the final panels here. Okay. Hey, did you go on pie like you said you would to check out the glass there? Yes, I did. And it was actually really cool, especially looking from inside out. But the glass there isn't structural yet, is it? No, not yet. But we do have two new design numbers, which will be the very first yachts to have structural glass in there. Okay, cool. So the tests that we did at the time are going to be used on those two new design numbers. Yeah, straight from R&D to reality. So no more millions between the glass. And those two design numbers, correct, no more millions. Did Guido actually do something with the sun control foil? Yes, he did. He compared the numbers with the energy load. Yeah. And it looks like we can save up to 10% of the total hotel energy load, which is a lot. It's the same as like 40 solar panels. That's really a lot. Yeah. Did you actually ever see 
the sun control foil? No, I saw the calculation, but I haven't seen the foil yet. I have a sample with me, and if you look close enough, then you can see here that you see a very slight difference between the foil and where it isn't. Well, it's amazing that such a foil can make a big difference. Yeah. Yeah, it even blocks 99% of the infrared. 99%, okay, that's a lot. It's so interesting to watch these videos because they, they make it come across as, it, as if it's so common, but it's amazing innovation, which makes me look at uh, Bram and, uh, and Jan. Um, glass as a design feature, why has that become so important? I, I see glass always as, uh, as, as the hamster ball uh, in the, the movie of Jurassic Park. It, it can create that, that immersive experience of that environment outside in comfort and in safety. Um, when that environment could be less comfortable or safe, um, it could be uh, wet and windy uh, in our yacht uh, environment or, or cold or uh, very hot. <laughs> Yeah, Bram, yeah, I must say, I love, I love that metaphor. Um, it's, it's, it's a great one. Um, but uh, yeah, you're talking about uh, all these different circumstances and I can imagine energy saving. So Ian, um, could you share a little bit about that with us? Yeah, sure. Um, it's quite interesting. Over the last 10 years, we've seen um, a trend to adopt uh, ever higher performing glass in terms of limiting the solar gain. Uh, you know, the greenhouse effects uh, and things have certainly moved on from the days of simple uh, body tinted glass, which is which is quite dark, really. Uh, and at the same time, there's been a, a trend for maximizing the transparency so we can better connect the owners to their surrounding uh, land or seascapes. Uh, this creates a bit of a conundrum in some ways in that these two trends are kind of pulling in two different directions. So the challenge really is about finding the sweet spot between these competing aspects and trying to control the uh, visual light transmittance and the clarity of the glass while still giving a good uh, solar performance, which kind of drives the uh, AC design on, on, the, on the vessel. Uh, and really, to, to do this uh, successfully, you need to have a really good understanding of the, of the glass engineering and the, and the fabrication techniques. Uh, and you know, the image of Pi, which is shown here on the screen, is a a fantastic example of how to really deploy these things uh, in a successful way. Um, one other interesting uh, development in glass technology um, is so-called dynamic glass. So this is glass that can uh, change at the flick of a, uh, of a of a switch or change its transparency. So you can have either uh, transparent or dark glass so you can maximize the views when you need them uh, and limit the solar gain at other times. Wow, yeah, no, it sounds very, very interesting. Um, and something else that also that stood out in this video that we saw, Bram, was like, you know, glass without mullions, like, how? Now that's actually, it's, uh, it's the next step in, in a trend that has, has yeah. a long history. Um, if you look back to the 60s, uh, yachts had about 7% of their uh, profile area was glass, you know, like little portholes, little windows. And that has grown into the, the current yachts, like, like Pi, um, up to 30%. So at a certain stage, we saw that actually the superstructure became more glass than structure. So that, uh, that led us to think, uh, what if we actually use the glass as a structure? So we have to integrate the physical uh, properties of glass in the, the, the construction of the yacht. Um, so we, uh, we uh, first uh, uh, threw a lot of th theory at it, uh, uh, did uh, FEM and all kinds of uh, calculations. And um, uh, further on, uh, we actually uh, tested uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of glass. So um, what we did was we, uh, we destroyed about uh, 15 or 20 full-size windows, 30 millimeters uh, of glass, uh, with uh, the, the hydraulic cylinders that, uh, that you see here. And we actually had to put about 15 tons in each direction to, to break these windows. So you can imagine that they can carry a lot of load. Um, and so uh, that's, that's when engineers have, uh, have fun. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, we, we can do that. And um, it has never been done on yachts, not even by us. Uh, Venus was, uh, was different, but it has been done uh, land-based. So that is uh, what's, what's shown here. This is the Steve Jobs Theater. And that's a, this is actually an earthquake-proof building. So if that can be done, 
it certainly can be done uh, on a yacht. So that's, that's when we uh, turn to designers like Jan to make it happen. Yeah, I'm just, I'm really happy because I've seen the development with our R&D guys that this is now being brought to life and you broke so much glass to make it work. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really uh, happy with that because we can create, like this uh, theater, amazing views from, uh, from our observation lounges uh, on the top of the boat. Uh, or we can create a panor panoramic view for an owner's uh, suite. The thing we have there is, an, is most of the times is that we also want to black it out. So you want yeah. to be able to sleep properly. And that's where Ian's proposal of having this blackout glass is very convenient as well. So I'm just yeah. happy with the development because we've been waiting for it a yeah. bit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, it's it's mind blowing really. Um and I also know that there's also been using a lot more glass. We saw Tonno with one of the pictures in the developments uh, that are you being used in pools. So Ian, I was wondering if you could maybe show us a little bit more about that. Yeah, sure. Um I mean the for pools um, like that used in Faith, uh, the, yeah. the design intent really is to create an entire glass system. So it comprises of many, many glass panels and uh, you're trying to sort of maximize the transparency otherwise why you're using glass in the first place. Um, and the key challenge on, on this project is about developing the details so that you can um, still deal with all the, the whole movements, but also trying to keep all the the, the visible con uh, connections and joints down to an absolute minimum, which is which is a bit of a task. And sometimes the, the simplicity that you see here with glass actually belies the engineering complexity to, to make it happen. Uh, and this is a really good example as well of how to really push the limits of what's possible uh, in terms of scale and curved form in glass fabrication. And there's an S-shaped panel that you can see at the bottom of this pool. Um, at the time, this was most one of the most challenging um, panels ever fabricated. Uh, so it's a really, really exciting to evolve with. Yeah, and you, you did a great job there, uh, there actually, uh, uh, Ian. But um, as soon as you are finished with that, uh, that, that pool, then um, we have to integrate that into our yacht. So that means yeah. that uh, we have a hole in our deck, um, which has to be uh, uh, a class-proofed uh, watertight uh, uh, closure. Well, it's a pool, so that'll happen. Um, it has to be incorporated in the stability, and uh, you can imagine we have now pools of 60 tons uh, on our yachts, uh, the largest ones, so they, they have a definite impact on the, on the yacht. And um, uh, the thing that probably is, is, is most interesting to owners is the fact that uh, boats move at sea, and when boats move, um, sometimes the pool sloshes. And uh, that can be very annoying, of course. So we have a, a, a tremendous tool set to, uh, to deflect water back into the pool, to keep it inside the pool. So we can do uh, CFD calculations. We have details that, that deflect and disrupt uh, waves forming in the pool. Um, we can even do model testing on the pool itself. So we have a, a, a complete uh, toolbox of, uh, of stuff to, uh, to, to use to keep the water inside of the pool. Um, so there's a lot of technical effort in, uh, in a, a little blue bit on the GA, actually. Yeah, well, sometimes it's not just uh, a bit of blue on a GA, <laughs> <laughs> because we can uh, make a multi-purpose use out of the deck by, uh, by, by lowering or, or, or raising the floor of the, of the, of the pool. Um, so the day you just have a pool, and then at night you, has, you have a dance floor. Um, yeah, so it's, wow. it's like a m moving surface. Yeah. That's immediately the, the right introduction to the next part. Okay. Uh, thank you, Bram and, uh, and Jan, because the, we just participated at the, uh, at the Monaco Yard Show, and we have a, uh, an interactive model at the, at the Yard Show of one of the recently de uh, delivered yachts. And I was playing around with the buttons, and uh, what, <laughs> what these buttons did, they made the hatches open up, they made the beach clubs open, and all these elements of movement on a yacht. Uh, so maybe it's a good way to um, introduce the next video about hatches. Hey, Florian, good to see you. What brings you here today? Just checking some new striking features of our new yacht equipment. Sounds good, for a certain reason. Well, they made some changes which improves the reliability and serviceability of our equipment. So what about you? Same here, also checking in for the current status of the new project. For new build, we also made a lot of adjustments. Oh, which ones? 
the seal is different now, um, which will result in a much cleaner look uh, and will create a better customer experience. So more space available for clients? Definitely. Cool, how did you achieve this? We redesigned the technique behind the platform that is now more compact than ever and also be ready to be electrical driven in the future. That sounds sustainable. Will it be applicable on special equipment as well, such as multi pie? Yeah, for sure. The advantage of starting these improvements now is that we also can make the specials more compact than ever, which will create a maximum customer experience. Cool. Good to see we're constantly improving our yacht equipment. Gotta go back to it now. See you soon. Bye. Wow, that is it's just wonderful, isn't it? But I do wonder, uh, Bram, is there a growing interest in these moving <coughs> objects on board? Yes, definitely. Yeah. Um, what we've seen in the in the past uh, decade, say, is that uh, uh, we started out with a single hull door. Um, uh, we had already a couple of uh, very nervous engineers when we built Faith with five doors, and we're currently building a boat uh, which has uh, 29 moving objects on board: so sliding, folding, hinging, uh, and that is not even counting the the, the normal uh, uh, hinged accommodation doors and sliding doors. So. Um, we're basically building a, a very big uh, Swiss cheese, so <laughs> don't tell the owner. Um, that means, of course, that that has an impact on uh, on construction. We have to take yeah. really, really good care that that con that construction, that hull, with all those holes in there, um, is rigid. Because um, if you don't get enough rigidity, you'll uh, you'll get uh, deformations, uh, you'll get uh, uh, vibrations uh, uh, throughout the boat. So you you have to prevent that. And um, we have developed an in-house method uh, at FedShip to assess the required stability, or sorry, the required rigidity for, uh, for a yacht. So we can do uh, very, very early in the design stages, we, uh, we check the main dimensions of the boat. So we make absolutely sure that it complies with our standards there, which are usually more than uh, what, uh, what class is, uh, is asking for. Um, so another trend, uh, I think, with uh, all these openings is that um, they used to be um, uh, uh, functional and, and in public spaces, but they're getting more and more into the, uh, the private environment of the guests. So you have uh, guest suites with balconies, and that, that creates whole different challenges and, and opportunities. Yeah, I guess it's a lot of extra opportunities, to be honest, uh, to create... Uh uh, protection from the uh, from the elements at at one point, and in the other moment you're completely open to the to the ocean and to your environment. So, I'm very happy we have all these kind of different uh, uh, holes in the Swiss cheese <laughs> <laughs> we can use to see out. But Jan, does that mean that also the you know the owners they can they, they can um, operate these balconies themselves? Uh, some of them are, are quite difficult. You have to set you have to fold it down and set up the the safety guards. Uh, but we also have um, uh, inboard balconies, as we call them, which you just enter through a sliding door within your cabin. So you just walk out and you're straight on your uh, on your private deck, which is a very nice uh, solution. It's used on uh, W and uh, uh, W, formerly Larissa, for instance. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I also I also heard of this next level application where they use like a slide out jacuzzi. I mean, could you explain a little ah. bit like how, how that works? Um, yeah, so we, we have this concept um, and we, it's a very big ma main area. It's really big, so we want to create a big space. But we wanted to create nooks, so we made a balcony. And when we saw the balcony stick out, we thought it would be nice if you would sit there in a jacuzzi with a glass <laughs> bottom suspended over the water. So you're over the waves in your own bubbles. So to say. So wow! Well, yeah, the idea. I mean, and that is that is incre incredible. But I, I then wonder, like, so, uh, how do you come up with these ideas? Like, how does something get from like a sketch to a reality, like we see in this uh, specific example? So are, are you asking me? <laughs> well, yeah, I guess. <laughs> when it becomes difficult, ask the market. Yeah, ask right? the market. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it's basically very simple. Um, throughout the years, we've seen so many beautiful designs coming out, but also designs that are way off the charts. 
And the thing is at Fetchip is that we have clever people looking with the design, uh, designers um, whether we can build it, yes or no. So we have naval architects, we have uh, specialists, we have engineers, and throughout the design process, we have immediately a, the checks and balances, balances in place to make sure that th something is makeable. So that's basically how we do it. And maybe uh, you have an example, probably? Yeah, of course, uh, <laughs> lots of them. Yeah. Um, I think for me, the, the, the most, uh, most uh, uh, epic example is, uh, is, is Motoyacht Venus. So um, we found a, a very, very early sketch of, uh, of Venus, a 15 centimeter uh, little sketch, um, which was made by, actually by Tano, um, uh, together with uh, the owner and, and Philippe Stark, which defined um, uh, the look of that, uh, that 78 meter masterpiece. And I, I could go on for an hour and a half about uh, the, the, the engineering and design processes of that boat, but um, I think two things are, are very important to note. It's, it's an aluminum boat. It was the longest uh, aluminum yacht at the time, and it's actually uh, stiffer than some of our, uh, our steel yachts. It's a tremendous uh, um, uh, achievement. And the second thing, of course, is those huge windows. Um, uh, these are windows of 10 by 2.5 meters. Wow. And these are still the largest ones that have ever been applied on a yacht. Wow. So, yeah, it's uh, yeah. good stuff. Yeah, we, uh, we have, um, I can remember we had a concept in which we had a, a, a water slide going from the top deck all through the boat and then ending up uh, in the sea. Uh, you could actually choose if you would end up in the sea uh, or, or in a pool. And uh, we had a client for it, so we engineered it uh, all the way through. Uh, that was, uh, was quite, uh, quite cool to see. Uh, we didn't build it in the end. Um, but it was also quite interesting to see that you could end up either in the sea <laughs> or in the pool. Wow. And uh, yeah, I, I also I remember uh, uh, one of Ian's projects with a pool as well. It was also quite interesting. What yeah, um, I don't know. For yeah. those who, who haven't seen it, we, um, we engineered the, the Skyfall project, uh, which is a transparent pool nine stories up in the air, spanning 14 meters between two buildings in, in London. Um, you can see it on the image shown there. Uh, I mention it because it's a great example of what's possible, really, if there's a willing engineering and manufacturing team, uh, as well as a sort of strong and uncompromising vision from the client, uh, this is what you can get. Um, it's actually not glass, it's uh, made from acrylic, which is a better material for this type of um, application. And I don't know, who knows, maybe we'll uh, see something uh, similar on a yacht project in the not, not too distant future. <laughs> Well, wow, these, these possibilities are really mind-blowing. And I do wonder, d did you ever receive like a request that you really thought, oh, we're not even going to think about this? Tano, I'm sure you can answer that question for me. I'm sure I can, Guy. <laughs> yes, uh, well, you're asking whether we have ever had an impossible question, I, th I suppose. Yeah. Uh, we rather see impossible questions as cool questions. <laughs> and only impossible when proven impossible. <laughs> so, uh, and, uh, and having said that, we of course we had a few of those questions. And one of those questions I can I can just show you about it. It's about wine. I can't show you the the, the whole project. However, the story is pretty nice. I think. Um, what happened was the client came to us, and it's more like a James Bond question. Uh, when I'm sitting at the dining table on the top deck, I would like to just point out which uh, which type of wine I, I would like to have from the cellar down below, totally in the bottom of the yard, and then it just pops up on my table and there it is. So yes, impossible question, no, it's a very good question, it's a very cool question, I would like to have that. However, how are we going to make that? So what we did was we immediately thought about uh, uh, a pneumatic tube system. So you've got some kind of robotic uh, wine cellar down below uh, that picks the wine that you type in on, on, the, on the top, and then it goes into the tube, it all goes through the boat, uh, up to the, the top deck, and then it's there, bloop, there you have it. That, that works. For so far, the wine wasn't that good anymore when it arrived on the top deck. <laughs> it shakes in different ways. Uh, it's not good for expensive wines, I can tell you. Uh, now I can tell you, I've learned that. <laughs> um, uh, so yes, it, it was a very cool question. We looked at it, but it was impossible, yeah. unfortunately. Unfortunately. Well, Tano, I have to say, I, I admire your passion for, for trying and for, for just diving into it completely. But 
of course, we do want our wine to taste good, right? We do want our wine to taste good. And, uh, Jan, we want our ships to be pure. Oh, yeah, thank, indeed. Uh, yeah, so this year, uh, thank you, Katje, we, uh, we, uh, we had the opportunity again to do a concept, which we've been doing for about 15 years, since uh, 2006, uh, our Xtreme uh, uh, came out. Um, so this year we sat down with our team uh, and, and evaluated last year where we do about 80 uh, prospects a year, uh, what the latest trends were. And sat together with the CEOs and, and came up with a short brief um, in, in which the exterior uh, should be uh, simple and, and very uh, have, a, have its own character and the interior should pe bring people together. So what we did is use as few lines as possible and really sculpt with the surfaces to create some twist and the volume uh, to have the perfect proportion. So this is the part I really like is really sculpting it. Uh, we use glass which is fritted so it has on the outside it's similar to the paint and from the inside you can still look out. Uh, this is to enhance the volume of the, of the paint basically to create a, um, a, 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 a truly a character of a boat, a different character you would spot from, uh, from far away. Um, then from the inside we looked at bringing people together. So in a simple way, we made a very big space where we created uh, the dining and the lounge as well as the main staircase. So this is all brought together. Then we connected it through an atrium with the deck above and then pushed that atrium outside. So you're not uh, connecting the, the upper to the, the lower two decks, but also inside out, so diagonally. Um, and um, it, this creates incredible views and incredible interaction, of course, which is all inspired a bit by COVID in this period as well, to bring families together. But you could also have a great party there, of course, that's for sure, around these uh, amazing pool areas. Um, then another thing we, we were also working on for a long time, also with the R&D department, is to have a more view, a more uh, a forward facing owner cabin. And it's, sometimes it's quite difficult and then you stack the owner's cabin with the wheelhouse. So to create a lower profile, we thought about having the wheelhouse in a different location by using uh, current trends as well and big screens. So we pushed the owner's cabin down, uh, the, the, the wheelhouse down, to create a command center in which you have uh, uh, 270 or 360 degrees around um, screens uh, with cameras which are in the hall. So all the way around the hall you can see out and you overlay these screens then, which are then showing your surrounding with information like if your vessel's coming nearby, you can show the speed, you can say show its length, uh, the heading, uh, and give all uh, a lot more information about your environment than we already have. So basically we're not trying to mo just move it, but also improve its functionality. Um, and that created this, uh, this um, yeah, amazing command center, which Bram also <laughs> had his uh, big part. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, um, <laughs> we got quite some uh, some response from that uh, that uh, that feature on the Indeed. on the boat. Um, people uh, wondering uh, what uh, what uh, what came into our minds to propose something like that. But um, I uh, yeah, I have to look at it from from uh, not the perspective of moving a wheelhouse, but um, a wheelhouse has a function. So uh, the wheelhouse has the function to give uh, uh, situational awareness. To, uh, to house uh, decisions and to house control. So these thru, uh, three uh, uh, things have to be done in the wheelhouse. And if I put system behind it, then I have basically an autonomous ship. So um, from that point, <laughs> moving backwards, when do you think, Katje, the first autonomous ship will sail? Ooh, asking me a question, Herr Bram. Okay, well, I would, say <laughs> I would say two years. Two years, well, uh, close, no cigar. Actually, <laughs> the first boat was launched uh, last year. Oh. Um, it's a small container vessel in, uh, in Norway, um, which is currently trialing, and is supposed to uh, enter full autonomous service by next year. Wow. So, um, the way I see it, um, the wheelhouse, um, that situational awareness system, is already there. It is on board that boat. Um, so we move that downstairs and we just put a human decision and control system. So we're not even making it as difficult as doing an autonomous ship. So, yeah, 
we can do this. Wow, well, mm -hmm. no, it sounds absolutely incredible. Um, I am sure there are many, many questions from our audience. So I would say, let's have a look. Uh, but Farouk, if you already have a question. Well, <coughs> or thank you for that. While, you, while you're uh, looking at the questions from the audience, um, actually the command center is the ultimate gaming console for, the, uh, for Eva's uh, millennials and Gen Z gen generation. It's actually a fidgetal a wheelhouse. I learned a new word today. Absolutely. <laughs> fidgetal. But, but you gave this presentation during the Monaco Yacht Show at a summit, and there were a few captains in there. How did they respond, Jan? Um, yeah, actually, at that moment, uh, uh, these uh, these were captains who had, had given a presentation before, and they were sitting there. So we know they, they were sitting there, and we, you know, we basically asked them what they thought. Um, and these guys were saying that, okay, this is a new thing, and we have to uh, we have to get used to it. Uh, but as long as we have a wind control or something on the top of the boat where we can actually drive the boat uh, and seeing outside, uh, in in case of we're going through reefs or etc., then we're sure we sure we can do it. So the reaction was quite positive, and we got uh, yeah, exactly the kind of feedback we wanted at that point. So I was really happy with that moment. Yeah. yeah. Thank wow, you. That's, that's a good question. Um, yeah, and I have some, some nice questions popping up here. I have a question from Frank uh, for Ian. Ian, are you still with us? Ah, there you are. I'm still here. Um, so the question is, is there a physical limit to glass which can be used on a yacht? Uh, I mean, if that means the the, the size limit, then um, then you're limited to uh, the biggest panels that they can make, which is up to 20 meters. So yeah, they're pretty. They can get pretty big. Um, we haven't used it yet, but there's no reasons why not. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you for answering that question. Um, we have another question from Mark for Bram. Um, pool sloshing can be a real issue. I hope I pronounce that correctly, can be a real issue with water spilling. Why not a system to damp the water motions? Um, yeah, we actually, uh, we, we thought about that and there's, uh, there's uh, a couple of R&D projects uh, uh, currently running in that, that direction. Um, we've actually devised a system where you could uh, uh, put the pool on a uh, magnetic levitation system so that when the boat moves, the pool doesn't, so the boat moves below the pool, so oh, uh -huh. the pool doesn't move, the pool doesn't slush. <laughs> I think that's a great solution. It is, of course. Yeah, it is. <laughs> 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 uh, there, there is uh, uh, some engineering to be done, uh, doubtlessly, but uh, obviously, yes. Obviously, obviously. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Bram. And I have a question for you, Jan, uh, from Walter. As the market changes dramatically, but into the right direction, how do you adapt the communication accordingly to the ne new needs and clients? Um, the communication. Um, yeah, of course, in this last period, we had a lot of communication with clients via Zoom, etc. if that's what you mean. Um, but still, of course, we have to ship samples, etc., to to show them actually what it's going to be. But it's... Uh, it, it, it's at the same time it's challenging and at the same time it's a lot of fun because you have quite a quite quick interaction when you use Zoom uh, with uh, with different types of, uh, of, of renderings and animations, etc. Um, but sometimes it's more difficult to read the body language if somebody really likes something. So, uh, yeah, we're, we're working on it and, and it's getting better and it get, creates opportunities but also challenges. So, yeah. 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 Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Um, and Farouk, also a question for you. Uh, from Marilyn, the yacht industry has long been focused on the newest, latest model. How do you suggest changing the messaging to, as Francesca said, quality and longevity, speaking to sustainability? Very so interesting question. Yeah. And Marilyn, did she ask difficult <laughs> questions? Too? Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> we, were, we were just um, uh, discussing actually the element yeah. of quality. Uh, and what is quality exactly? And, and Pedro mentioned just a second ago that, that quality has everything to do with consistency. When you buy a bottle of wine of a certain brand, you cannot smell it, you cannot uh, uh, taste it because it's still uh, uh, um, uh, not opened yet. W but you still buy it simply because you have the trust that the quality level is still the same. I think that that applies for the definition of uh, what, what quality is. 
and communicating about this industry and the changes that are coming. I think we have a, a long way to go. Uh, if you look at our uh, Super Yacht Life Foundation, we are trying to make sure that we bring across the right message of how this industry is evolving. And I think it's an, it's an industry-wide initiative that we simply need to abide by, showcasing the level of craftsmanship, showcasing the level of innovation, but also our real care uh, about how we evolve uh, uh, about uh, sustainability and environmental issues. In the end, that specific uh, uh, topic, in the end, it has everything to do with the fact that without clean oceans, there's no yachting. So I, I think that she means that with how we need to communicate. I don't think it's a simple task for FedShip. It's an industry-wide initiative that we need to uh, uh, address. And I think it's also a healthy competition uh, uh, talking about fuel cell technology or hydrogen-powered boats or using alternative materials and so on. I think it's a good thing that all the competition is actually doing that and we learn from each other because the, it's, it's each, way, uh, each time a step forward. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, beautiful last question, I think, because unfortunately we have come to the end of today's episode. So for all pending questions, we will make sure that they will get answered. I just want to take the opportunity to thank our guest, Bram, Jan, Ian. I know you're still out there. Thank you so <laughs> much for joining us today. Um, so yeah, thank you, uh, gentlemen. And Farouk, um, I would say, how about just a little recap of today's episode. Uh, yeah, thank you for that. First of all, thank you for the way you moderate this in your fun and, and also <laughs> you, really, you really enjoy it. Um, what I want to say, <coughs> going through all the information that has just uh, uh, come by, uh, first of all, I want to uh, express how proud we are on our workforce because you see the yeah. nature of people that are working at FedChip and the enormous knowledge and, and, and you know, mastering all the uh, creation of dreams and translating that in something that is makeable yeah. in, a, um, in, in, the, in a way that is absolutely the highest standard ever. Um, that's all done by the heroes that are working for FedChip. So that's the first thing that I wanted. And it, comes, it becomes so clear to me each and every time when I see them perform like this. Um, translating, or the, the summary for, uh, for this episode, um, it's all about analytics. Analytics is, is absorbing all the innovation and trends and try to translate data in applicability. And I think we showcase that by show, uh, showing all the new trends that are coming on, uh, that are on our path of to, uh, today and, and making sure that these trends are translated into the complexi complexity of our yachts. Um, so we had wonderful speakers and I think we have mm. been able to inspire our viewers. I'm sure we did and I could not have said it in any better way, Farouk. So thank you also for guiding me through this episode. And really, thank you so much. And of course, again, all our wonderful speakers and all of you for tuning in. I indeed hope you had a little sneak peek into the future and also what the future already is right now. So we do hope to see you again next time in our episode number four sometime in December. So do stay tuned in with us uh, for date updates. And uh, we are looking forward to see you then. Thank you all for watching and see you next time.